You know, that we live at a time where not only things like the Patriot Act, which kind of become these Christmas trees where everybody says, I have a great idea, I've wanted to do this for 10 years, and now I have an argument for it. There's terrorism, now we must do this. But you think we live at a time where a president of the United States declares that he can have arrested an American citizen in America and have him locked away in a brig without access to the courts or attorneys. It's an extraordinary claim in a republic. Or that the president can sit down with his hundred closest advisors and have video screens and slides and decide who to kill. Where you just kind of decide, you know, it's kind of like the old Roman emperor, you kind of do this or this. Well, that person I think deserves it, this one really doesn't, and these can be American citizens. Now, when you're dealing with terrorists, there's some difficult decisions to make, but still, one should feel kind of creepy about this in a democratic republic. Randolph Bourne said that war was the health of the state, and we see it in cases like this. It certainly lies. You know, not only dead Americans, which matter, <clears throat> but also dead foreigners. You know, the grand humanitarian adventure in Iraq, I think the starting point for estimates of dead Iraqi civilians is probably around 200,000. Now, we didn't kill them, but we blew up the place, and they died in the aftermath. That is a consequence of action that we have to take into account, that unfortunately war tends not to be very humanitarian. And one wants to be very careful when one wanders around the world loosing the dogs of war about what's going to happen to the society within which those dogs charge. We also see in the lives of American uh, per military personnel the disruption of their lives. The reserves, for example, who've been treated in ways they never expected, where suddenly they go called up again and again. And the, you know, the pressure at times for a draft. If you really want to have an imperial policy and patrol the globe, how do you manage that? How do you patrol other societies? How do you occupy and transform other societies? But I think what's you know, very important here is it doesn't even serve our security interests. Now, a security interest would be the most obvious one. You go to war because you think it's necessary for your security. But I think it's important to recognize <laughs> you know, that if you look at you know, kind of what you get, you know, that the wars you know, typically don't help us very much. That what you find is we get drawn into war. Military action tends not to stop where it is. You know, the assumptions that people make is these are going to be easy. You know, in World War I, as they marched off to war, people were cheering. I mean, they had you know, noted you know, cases where, for example, Russian royalty were saying, we're all going to meet in Berlin. Of course, these are the people who were slaughtered by the Bolsheviks. It's like, oops, that didn't work out very well. There was a famous former US senator from South Carolina, Senator Chestnut, and he offered, you know, as the Civil War was breaking, he said he would drink all of the blood that would be shed as a result of secession. That's another one of those oops, you know, 620,000 lives later, maybe that didn't work out quite as well as he wanted. We think of Vietnam, where, I mean, early years, Americans presumed this was going to be quite easy. Iraq was going to be a cakewalk. That very often these things turn out far, far worse than one expects. The costs are far, far higher than ever imagined. And even the steps that kind of short of war tend to get you into wars. Alliances, we hope, will def you know, prevent war, but alliances also act as tripwires. They act as transmission belts of war. If you guarantee the security of another power, you get drawn in. And World War I is a fabulous example. You know, in uh, June 28th, I think it was in Sarajevo, you know, some Serbian nationalist decides to off the Archduke of Austria-Hungary. Now, this is not something that really should concern the United States, shouldn't be of a great interest to Japan, really shouldn't have been that important to uh, you know, even Great Britain. But lo and behold, it's the few, it's the, the lighter you know, the flame that hits and the fuse that goes to the bomb, because that means Austro-Hungary has to go after Serbia because it's state terrorism. The Russians have to defend Serbia because it's an ally. The Germans have to go to Austria's defense because they're allies and they're encircled. The French are allied with Russia, so they come in. The Brits don't like this. They don't want German domination of the continent. And ultimately, America shows up in the conflict, and so does Japan. And lo and behold, we have a world war because of some damn fool thing in the Balkans. The point is these alliances can be extraordinarily dangerous. You know, we think they're going to deter conflict, but very often what they do is they lead to conflict. They expand conflict. And what you find is intervention tends to be endless. We are still dealing with the consequences, going back to 1953, of having pushed out Prime Minister Mossadegh and brought in the Shah. Of course, lo and behold, the Shah wasn't very nice. People in, Iraq, in Iran don't like him. They throw him out. The Muslim kind of crazy people take control. Now, of course, we defend and we support Iraq when it decides to invade Iran because we're worried about the crazies. Well, then guess what happens? It's Iraq who decides it wants to take over the Gulf, so we have to go to war with them and put troops in Saudi Arabia, and that, of course, gets Osama bin Laden mad, and on it goes. Now, of course, we're still worried about the Iranians because those crazy people now want nuclear weapons. Oh, my goodness. Now, that was what I thought Iraq was supposed to want, but oh, well. 
<laughs> These things never end. The moment you get in them, social engineering doesn't work very well at home. Boy, try it abroad when you know nothing about the region, nothing about history, nothing about the religion, nothing about anything else. Boy, it really works well. Then we have terrorism. I want to emphasize terrorism is an awful thing. Nothing justifies it. But it's important to recognize there are consequences of actions. You know, I mean, Ronald Reagan found this. I worked for Ronald Reagan. But Ronald Reagan decided to put US troops in the middle of a civil war in Lebanon. At the time, there were 25 different armed groups. This was not a good place to put American troops as peacekeepers, especially when they were supporting the government that controlled little more than the capital. But lo and behold, and you go back at the time, you go through the archives of the New York Times, what you find is you can find stories on the uh, New Jersey sitting offshore, the battleship bombarding Muslim villages. Now, this is not something that's uh, likely to make folks happy. And lo and behold, some folks, they don't have you know, their own battleships. They don't have aircraft carriers. So what they do is they take out after the US Embassy and they take out after the Marine Corps barracks. There are consequences. And those consequences, even groups that don't have the same kind of power that we have want to strike back, and they look for ways to strike back. That unfortunately, the more you act and get involved and do things, the more likely you are to find people wanting to go after you. We find that now with the drones, you know, with war in Afghanistan and Iraq. Now, one might decide these are absolutely necessary, but you count the cost. There was a very interesting discussion. The guy in uh, you know, Times Square who tried to set off the bomb didn't work out. You know, they arrested him. He's before the judge. And the judge says, why did you do this? And he said, because the US is killing Pakistanis. And the judge said, yeah, but there are civilians here in Times Square. And he said, that, that doesn't matter. They elect their government. They're responsible. And the judge said, oh, but come on, there are kids. And he says, well, the American government doesn't care. It drops drones all over and kills anybody that it wants. Now, this doesn't justify what he did, but it gives a sense of how some people respond. And I always tell people, it's important to try to reflect on how we would react if somebody was doing to us what we do to them. If the Chinese were dropping drones across American neighborhoods explaining they were killing terrorists, we might have a rather unsettled and unhappy view of the Chinese, more so perhaps even than Mitt Romney did uh, during the campaign. You know, that these are challenges for us to understand that the more you act, the more you intervene, the more you engage in military conflict and combat, you are likely to create enemies who are likely to try to respond. So today, the US has an extraordinarily dominating position. We account for roughly half of the world's military spending. We spend more in real terms than we spent at any point during the Cold War, the Vietnam War, or the Korean War. Now, that would suggest we are more endangered today than at any point in any of those periods. And that is insane. The Soviet Union is gone. The Warsaw Pact is gone. Maoist China is gone. We are allied with most of the industrialized states on Earth. You take us plus the Europeans, the Japanese, the Australians, and the South Koreans. We have 80% of the military spending. Are we really that endangered? If we are, we have to ask why. And I would argue that if we are that endangered, it's because of our policies. That our policies are not, in fact, making us safe. Our policies are making us far more endangered. And these are consequences for young people today, because if these wars go on, it's a question of spending, it's a question of civil liberties, it's a question of being drafted into the military. It's any number of consequences that come out of that. Now, defense is important. It's in the Constitution. It's a constitutional responsibility. But I would argue that means defense of America, genuine defense, not trying to run the world, not creating a new imperium. It's not welfare for allies. You know, the Europeans have economic troubles, so why not let us defend them? Well, that was a great deal. Thank you very much. But maybe we have bigger troubles. Let them defend themselves. We today, much of our defense is actually out, you know, welfare for allies. It shouldn't be social engineering to try to rebuild failed societies. Both Malou and I have been to Afghanistan. It's a tragic situation. There are very good people there, people who want a liberal society. But I don't know how we can give it to them. I don't know how many years it will take, how many lives of Americans, how much money we have to spend. I don't think we can do it. So we have to ask what our core responsibilities are. And I don't think that kind of social engineering is right. You know, when should we risk the lives of Americans? When should we you know, spend the wealth of Americans? When should we threaten our liberty? When should we put our security at risk? It needs to be when something is critically at stake for the American people. And I think this is particularly important when one thinks of our own military personnel. When do you risk their lives when their own community has something at risk? They're not pawns in some global chess game to sacrifice in some grand design. You know, the great moment came with Madeleine Albright and uh, Colin Powell. And Madeleine Albright turns to Colin Powell and says, well, what's the use of having this wonderful military you keep talking about if we never use it? 
Now, Colin Powell is somebody who had signed letters to people who had died in Vietnam. He served in that war. And the next line in his autobiography was, I almost had an aneurysm. And that was an appropriate reaction. That is not the way to treat US military personnel. They serve to defend their society and their country. They don't serve to be sent off into some grand crusade for you know, the sofa samurai in Washington. This is something we should be very careful when we put their lives at stake. Something needs to be very critically important for our own society. <clears throat> War is the ultimate big government program. You know, it threatens lives, it threatens our liberties, it wastes our money, it puts our society in danger. We should do this only where something is absolutely critical. We have a system of ordered liberty in America. We focus on individual liberty and limited government. Our foreign policy should support that, not threaten it. Unfortunately, our current policy of constant war threatens the very fundamentals of American liberty rather than affirms it. 